Good morning. It is truly a good morning. I've had multiple requests for prayer today to give thanks to God for the gift of rain, which comes from him, so we will certainly be doing that today. Uh, we also have cause to rejoice. Uh, the vetters are celebrating their 50th anniversary this day, although I think it was, what, two days ago? Something like that. So many of family here and maybe some friends, so uh, welcome to our guests and visitors too. Our service is uh, on the screen, but you can also use the hymnal, and the service folder will help you with that. We started service one last week, and so that will be our liturgy for the day. Right. Um, and of course, what is, what is the greatest gift that we receive this day? It's yes, rain, and the gift of a wedding anniversary, but especially the gift of God's word and forgiveness Jesus gives. So let's begin then with a hymn of invocation, hymn 732, All Depends on Our Possessing.
I invite you to stand if you're able. Our service is Divine Service Setting 1, page 151. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O oh Lord, I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord. How long, O oh Lord, Will you forget me for ever? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Lest my enemies say, I have prevailed over him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. O oh Lord, I have trusted in your steadfast love. I will sing to the Lord. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, 
Let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, have it. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, the strength of all who trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers. And because through the weakness of our mortal nature we can do no good thing, grant us your grace to keep your commandments that we may please you in both will and deed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, and one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the first Sunday after Trinity is from Genesis chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The Lord looks down from heaven.
From where he sits enthroned, he looks out. He who fashions the hearts of them all. The king is not saved by his great army. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. Fear him. That he may deliver their soul from death. Our soul waits for the Lord. For our heart is glad in him. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Our soul waits for the Lord. And our shield. The epistles from 1 John chapter 4. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because, as he is, so also are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off, and Lazarus at his side, and he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water 
and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. Besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. To you, o Christ. You may be seated. We sing the hymn of the day, Lord Thee I Love with All My Heart.
He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. The parable of Lazarus and the rich man tells the story of two men. One of them has God the Lord as his master, and the other is ruled by mammon. The rich man is introduced first. He sports purple robes, the most expensive available. Moreover, he dresses himself every day in purple. He also wears high-quality Egyptian cotton in the ancient world used for underwear. Nothing but the best for our man. But he has a problem. Why the inner need to dress to the teeth every day? Well, apparently his desire is to impress the world with wealth and success, but it's never fully satisfied. As to food, he insists on sumptuous banquets, again, every day. Naturally, that means his staff is never given a day off. And due to their employer's self-indulgence, they cannot observe the Sabbath, dedicate themselves to hearing God's word. Thus, the rich man violates the third commandment, not only himself, but for his own employees. Let let alone also the spoken law of the times with the strict rules concerning Sabbath observance. And then what then of Lazarus? Lazarus is sick, unable to work, and apparently without extended family to assume full responsibility for him. The community, however, respects him and does what they can. At this, the rich man, at the rich man's gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus. That is, the community brought him before the rich man's gate. Because the rich man is the only man in town with the resources to help Lazarus adequately. Thus, Lazarus's friends carry, carry him daily to the ornamental gate at the entrance of the rich man's garden. The rich man and his guests cannot miss seeing him and passing by him. Perhaps they will help him. It's Lazarus' best and only option. But does their game plan work? No. And then we have the dogs. The dogs in biblical and rabbinical traditions are the most or almost as unclean as pigs. Dogs are kept as guard dogs, Isaiah 56 but never as pets. Only those who feed them dare approach them. A rich man needs such dogs because they are his home security system. The story assumes that the guard dogs are fed the scraps Lazarus longs to eat. So Lazarus goes hungry, and the dogs are fed. Yet these wild guard dogs, whom no one but their handlers dare approach, Even the dogs are the ones who realize that the weak, sick man by the gate is their friend. They lick his wounds. The saliva of a dog's mouth is sterile. The ancients discovered that healing occurs more rapidly when a dog licks a person's sores or wounds. We know this is true. We've even uncovered, archaeologists have, in the Philistine capital of Ashkelon, a center where they have 1,300 dogs buried in individual plots. It was one such healing center. The site has been identified as a Phoenician semi-religious center where the sick could go, pay a fee, and have trained dogs lick their wounds as medical treatment. In this story, the master refuses to help the poor sick man outside his gate, but his wild guard dogs will do what they can. They lick his wounds. Their master will not help Lazarus, but they will. Lazarus's quiet, gentle spirit breaks through their violent hostility to humans. And these untamed dogs care for him, knowing that he cares for them. Amazingly, throughout all of this, not a peep from Lazarus. He says nothing. The New Testament has two words for patience. One refers to the patience of the weak and suffering, and the other defines the patience of the strong, who have power over others. That first kind of patience, that of the weak and the suffering, is the patience of a victim. 
The second is the patience of a victor. The weak who suffer need, they, have, they need the ability then to endure. The word is often translated as long-suffering, and it is the patience of the oppressed who do nothing about hunger, hardship, and the injustice they endure. This describes Mary at the cross, by the way, and also, humanly speaking, is then seen in Jesus, too, who agonizes over enduring the cross while despising the shame. Jesus, like Lazarus, has no harsh words for all the evil forces that swirl around him. And then, like a clap of thunder, the drama quickly shifts. Lazarus dies and naturally has no funeral. He and his friends cannot afford one. But the angels are standing by to escort him to a banquet spread in his honor by the patriarch of the entire clan, Abraham himself. At the feast, Lazarus reclines on the chest of Abraham, that is, has the place of honor at the banquet table. The rich man also dies. He is buried. He had money, so he is given a funeral. No pauper's plot for him. No doubt it was a grand affair, but to his utter shock, then the rich man ends up in Hades. This is a classic pearly gate story that people use to make all sorts of astute political, ethical, or cultural comments about the ambiguities of life. But the dramatic surprises continue. The rich man sees Lazarus, recognizes his face, and can call his name, and thus he saw and even knew the sick man at his gate and chose to do nothing for him. But now the tables are turned. The rich man sees Lazarus in a position of authority and power at the right hand of Abraham and must make an abject apology to Lazarus, beg for his forgiveness. But then this is not what happens. The rich man, even in Hades, ignores Lazarus and addresses instead Abraham. Paraphrase, the rich man is saying, Abraham, I am suffering. This is not what I'm used to. When beggar types are hurting, it doesn't matter. There is always something wrong with them. But for people like me, this is terrible, and something must be done about it right now. I see that Lazarus is feeling better and is on his feet. Send him down with a nice cool drink. Unbelievable. At this point, the story should explode with justice. Lazarus is expected to let the rich man now have it with every four-letter word in the vocabulary. Maybe we'll clean it up a bit. The gist of what he is expected to say, Lazarus, towards that rich man is, you no good half-dead dog. You want me to serve you? You can't be serious. Where were you when I was hurting? You fed your dogs, but you wouldn't feed me. I longed to eat the scraps that you threw to them, but no, I wasn't worth it to you. Abraham, leave this monstrous ego to fry in hell. What's he suffering? What he's suffering is less than half of what he deserves. That's how the story should go, we think. But again, Lazarus is quiet. In his day of power at Abraham's side, he has no vengeance to exact. On earth, each day for Lazarus was a journey of faith. Like Abraham, he went out daily not knowing where he was going, not knowing if the Lord would provide or not. Of course, he would. Here, Lazarus exhibits, exhibits the other New Testament form of patience, the macrothemia. This is that other patience, not long-suffering, but the kind that puts away anger even in a day of power. Here is Lazarus, the victorious one, but who sets aside the vengeance he could right, rightly exercise. God was his master. His name was Lazarus, the one whom God helps Only with the help of God, then, can he be long-suffering in this life and even put away anger far away from him, even though the rich man deserves it. And at the end of the story, the rich man retains his pride, even in Hades, his total self-centeredness and his indifference to any suffering other than his own. He recognizes the resurrected Lazarus, but even seeing him, he makes no impression on him. Thus, his claim that such a vision of Lazarus back from the dead would bring his brothers to repentance 
That's even hollow and vain. It hasn't done it for him. It won't for them either. And why? Even in Hades, Mammon continues to rule his life. At the end of the day, the parable offers a profound insight into the ambiguity of possessions of Mammon. While they can have an indispensable potential for good to provide food and healing for the man at the gate, possessions can also create and feed self-aggrandizement and in the process dull the sensitivities to both the rights of his servants and to the needs that is of Lazarus or to others. The root problem Jesus gives explicitly is that he trusts in his wealth and not in the word. As Jesus says, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them in the voice of Abraham. They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. What the rich man lacks is the indictment of God's law, showing him his sin, and the daily rich forgiveness of Jesus. And without that indictment, repentance for the forgiveness of sins, worked by the word on the Sabbath day, we'd be just as selfish and dead as the rich man. The Bible clearly shows that material possessions are not to be our God. They belong to God and not to us. What we do with our possessions profoundly influences every area of our lives, in this world and the next. But we wouldn't know that or even believe it unless God told us, and again, the Sabbath day. What the rich man did with his mammon colored, shaped, and finally destroyed him. Like an alcoholic, he was unaware of his self-destructive behavior, even in its bitter conclusion. Was what Lazarus was able to do without mammon then becomes an inspiration by the Spirit. Why? Because mammon doesn't save him. He didn't even have it. Nor can mammon or wealth save you from sin. Can't give you the resurrection from the dead and certainly cannot give you to live forever. Never mind what all the globalists with their human utopia projects think. Thinking he has everything, the rich man fails to see that he has nothing that matters. And having nothing, poor Lazarus has everything that actually matters. Because faith in the God of Abraham can and does save you. Faith, like Lazarus, trusts God the Father, who gives everything needed for body and life. If it be life today, good. If it be death, thanks be to God. Faith trusts in Jesus Christ to deliver through his suffering and death, who has already opened heaven to all who believe in him. And that faith believes because the Spirit has worked faith in the heart, not by mammon, but by the preaching of his word. And trusting, then you are given to be long-suffering, patient, amid all pain, difficulty, loss, or like Lazarus, even in death. And trusting, you are given to put away all anger towards those who have much and even to those who have little and depend on you. They've, those neighbors have been placed before you to be cared for. So what is the world to you with all his vaunted pleasures? Nothing. Jesus, your priceless treasure, has already overcome the world along with its sin and death and the devil for you. And he gives you now in this very place and at this very moment the spoils of his victory, your forgiveness, eternal life, and salvation. Thanks be to Jesus in his holy name. Amen. We stand and we'll confess the creed, the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. 
and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the whole and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Loving Father, you have kept your promise to Abraham and brought forth the offspring in whom all nations are blessed and counted righteous, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Give to all people saving faith in this promised Savior and work in them the love that flows from your love alone. Lord, in your mercy, give boldness and diligence to all ministers of your church that they may proclaim the faith once delivered to the saints. Be with all vacant congregations and pastors considering calls. Send forth laborers into your harvest and sustain those you have sent. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord God, since we cannot love you whom we have not seen while we hate our brother whom we have seen, drive this day away from us all prejudice and hatred from our hearts with your, un, with your abiding love in Christ that we may truly show our love for you by loving one another. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, help our hearts to fear you rightly and to hope in your steadfast love. Fix your eye upon us and deliver us from death. Lord, in your mercy. God of love, perfect us in your love, that we may not fear your condemnation but have confidence in Christ for the day of judgment. Lord, in your mercy. Righteous Lord, keep us mindful of the poor who lie suffering at our gates, that we may use our many rich and sumptuous blessings from your hand to feed their hunger and ease their burdens in this world. Lord, in your mercy. Most gracious God and Father, we thank you and praise you for sending rain to water the earth causing it to be fruitful and to bring forth food and plenteous supply. Teach us ever to remember that we do not live on bread alone in order that we may receive your blessings with thanksgiving and your word with grateful hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you bestow us with many blessings, especially with the gift of holy matrimony. We rejoice with those celebrating their anniversary especially Ron and Joan, Ron and Janet, Jeff and Julie, Alan, Dennis, of course, Don and Jean celebrating this day. We also rejoice with those celebrating the gift of life on their birthday, Preston, Kayleen, Jacob, Dylan, Joan, Tyler, Natron, Nicholas, and Kira. We rejoice with those who remember the gift of new life received in holy baptism, especially Nicole, Rachel, Robert, Abigail, Patrick, Elizabeth, Ava, and Malaya. We pray for all the households of our church that they be strengthened by your word for faith and life, especially with Christine, Alex, Ron, Kara, Dick and Corey, and Wendy. For all this, Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, be gracious to all those in need especially our homebound, Marcy, Dan, Paul, Dolores, Merlin, and Pauline. Those who are ill, receiving treatment or recovering, especially Dale and Pam, Joe, Melanie, Kelsey, Marion, Christopher, Marcy, Brad, Gus and Eileen, 
Ron, Doug, Joan, Pat, Wendell, Darlene. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, give repentance and faith to all who come to your altar this day. Grant that we would not come seeking sumptuous earthly food, but instead discern your holy body and precious blood for the forgiveness of sins and receive it in the unity of a true confession. Lord, in your mercy. Finally, Lord God, Heavenly Father, we implore you to rule and govern our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that we may not, like the rich man, hear your word in vain and become so devoted to things temporal that we forget things eternal. Grant that we may serve those who are in need readily and according to our ability, not defiling ourselves with carousing or pride. In trial and misfortune, keep us from despair, and let us trust in your fatherly help and grace, that in faith and Christian patience we may overcome all things. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I invite you to greet one another with the peace of Christ, forgiving one another in his name. that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, 
We laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Of God you take away the sin of
The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. seated. We've had these 50th anniversaries, right? We had uh, Don and Karen a couple weeks ago, and now who do we have? Don and the Vetters? Don and Jean? Yeah. Today, um, by the way, they're welcoming all of you to their open house this afternoon here 
at the school, so I uh, invite you to do that. One to four, right? Oh, there you go. All invited, all in caps. Good luck missing that. All right, good. Uh, other announcements you can see there. There's some opportunities for service um, here at our property for the school, and there's more information in the folder. One thing I wanted to bring your attention to, obviously you knew that church was at 9 o'clock today because you're here. Uh, maybe not, obviously. I didn't see if anybody came in late, but hopefully you've got that memo now by now. It'll be that way through the summer. Um, there's forms in your mailboxes. Did you know you had a mailbox? All right. Well, if you didn't know you had a mailbox, almost everybody does. We actually discovered that maybe some of you don't. If you don't have a mailbox, we need to know that. That's the first step. Um, if you have a mailbox, you'll have a form that has the information we have um, about you because uh, we're, you know, we're uh, the all-seeing brother, right? The great big brother. We're over. We want all your information. No, that's not why. Um, no, we keep track of uh, birthdays, anniversaries, baptisms. You see those. Um, also, we, we do use that information as well as your confirmation date and um, if you've received a confirmation verse. We use those in, event, in the event of your death, which will happen someday, by the way. And at such time, it's really helpful if your family doesn't have to go find that information. All right? So please fill that out. Um, but actually, the, the, the best thing we need there is if your mailing address has changed, if you have a cell phone um, or email change, those in particular, please update those. Uh, we use kind of three methods to let you know what's going on. One, of course, is the, the uh, announcement sheet each week. Um, but in the event you don't get that, the other two forms of communication, which say the same thing, are going to be um, text message via cell, that's why we want cell, and um, email, all right? So especially in the event of an emergency or cancellation or something like that. So be sure to update that information sheet and put it back in there. Oh, there's also another spot in there, speaking of morbid. We've sang a lot about actually reaching our home above. We just sang that a few seconds ago. There's a spot where you can put in, um, in addition to your confirmation verse, other verses that you think would be appropriate in the event of your death for a funeral. Also, um, favorite hymns that would be appropriate to be sung at a, hymn, at a funeral as well. All right, do all that ahead of time for me, please. Um, because again, uh, Brothers and sisters don't always agree. Did you know that? Yeah. All right. So with that, um, happy anniversary to Don and Jean, and then also um, we have Bible study in a few minutes. All right. So if you can join us for that too, I'll be with you all.